today's edition of podcast hope you all are staying safe today is june 23rd 2020 i am rifat manan in philadelphia and i'm remotely joined by my good friend emilio madrigal who is in boston right now today we are very excited to welcome back dr andres matoso who is associate professor of pathology at johns hopkins university and he will be presenting on genital urinary pathology today the topic of today's discussion is somatic malignancy in germ cell tumors. As always, please feel free to post your questions or comments on Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and Dr. Matoso will answer them towards the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Matoso, for joining us today. Over to you now. Thank you, Rifat. Thank you, Emilio, for making this possible. And thanks, everyone, for joining this morning. Um, so I'm going to talk about somatic malignancy in testicular germ cell tumors. So first, we will start by the definition. So somatic malignancy is a distinct secondary component that resembles a somatic type malignant neoplasm as seen in other organs and tissues. They most commonly are sarcomas or carcinomas. The term teratoma with malignant transformation is not recommended because it may lead to the misconception that teratoma lacking malignant transformation is benign. The most commonly, they, they are most commonly arising from teratomas, but some of them can originate in yolk sac tumors and rare reports are out there that spermatocytic tumors can have sarcomatoid transformation. Those are very, very infrequent. So th these are more common in retroperitoneal lymph nodes, especially after chemotherapy with cisplatin-based uh, regimens. They can also occur in uh, primary tumors. They happen in approximately three to six percent of all germ cell tumors. So you can expect to see one uh, every 25 or 30 cases of germ cell malignancies. The interval from the diagnosis to the germ cell uh, tumor, I'm sorry, with um, somatic malignancy, it varies and can be as long as 30 years. Most commonly, this interval is longer in carcinomas, with probably more than five years after the initial diagnosis. In sarcomas, the, the medium for their peers is, is 20 months. So what do we have to find to make a diagnosis of somatic malignancy in germ cell neoplasia? We have to see an expansile or infiltrative growth pattern. By experts' agreement, the tumor must have a pure population of atypical, either mesenchymal or epithelial cells that expand at least one low power field. This is at 4x objective, which is about five millimeters in size. In contrast to teratoma, somatic type malignancy do not show the organoid arrangement of the stroma around the glandular component. One molecular test that we use and everyone can use to make this diagnosis is a fish for uh, overrepresentation of chromosome 12p. So as you know, germ cell tumors uh, frequently, more than 80% of them, have an isochromosome 12p or over representation of that chromosome 12p. So what we do in fish is you have two different probes with two different colors. Here, for example, in red, you will find the, uh, the uh, chromosome 12p and then in green, the centromere for chromosome 12. So you, you pick an area with 60 tumor cells and you draw a ratio between the red and the green dots. And if you have a ratio of more than 1.3, that signals that the uh, chromosome um, 12p is overrepresented in that sample. And we can see here on the right an example of, a, of an overrepresentation of red dots, while in the left is still normal. So the most common sarcoma arising in the teratoma or in the germ cell malignancy, it's rhabdomyosarcoma. 
The second most common is primitive neuroectodermal tumors, but you can also find leiomyosarcoma, angiosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, and then also you have to consider sarcoma toyopsa, especially in those cases that do not have any specific differentiation. The embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma is the most common of these sarcomas. How do you identify that at low power? What you see is a expansile population of small cells, small blue cells, round blue cells, that when you look at them closer, you will find some of the cells that have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm or strap cells. So some of them you will be able to see the striations. So this would be diagnostic of rhabdomyosarcoma. You meet the criteria in the forex field, and then you look at the cells and you identify some of them with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm or strap muscle cells. Grossly, the teratoma with rhabdomyosarcoma will differ from a teratoma in that it will have more solid areas, areas of necrosis, it's more fleshy because there is this expansive population of cells. But the teratoma is usually more mucinous and more cystic, as you can see here. Some rhabdomyosarcomas will be um, identified in the intertubular space. So you have to be wary about at these cases because not everything that you will find into, in between the, tub uh, the seminiferous tubules would be seminoma or embryonal carcinoma. And again, similar to the other image, what you have to look for in this monotonous population of the small blue cells is those cells with some um, elongated eosinophilic cytoplasm that shows uh, rhabdomyoblast differentiation. You can see them here again. And you appreciate in the seminiferous tubules the intratubular germ cell neoplasia in situ. These cells will express uh, myoid markers like desmin. So you can highlight here with desmin the rhabdomyoblast in between the inter, in, in the intertubular space. And the seminiferous tubules can have the intertubular germ cell neoplasia in situ highlighted by plaque or cicate. This is another example of a rhabdomyosarcoma arising in a germ cell tumor. You see the remaining testicular parenchyma here, and when you look at low power, you can see a monotonous population expanding more than four X field, and they're composed of primitive small round cells. At a closer look, you can see that the interstitium is a little edematous. The cells are highly atypical, hyperchromatic, but they're small, and with scanned cytoplasm. Occasionally, you will see some of the cells with the elongated eosinophilic cytoplasm characteristic of rhabdomyoblast. This is another look to another area of the same tumor. You can appreciate the interstitium is very edematous or mixoidish. And some of the cells will have scant amount or elongated uh, tails of eosinophilic cytoplasm. Those are the ones that will be positive for desmid. Here again, another one rhabdomyoblast in between a monotonous population of small blue cells, highly atypical. By immunohistochemistry, these tumor cells will express variable degrees of uh, muscle markers, including myogenin, actin, desmin, or myoD. You have to know that some cases will also be positive for CD99 or WT1 focally, which can lead to confusion. So these somatic malignancies sometimes have variable immunophenotype, and the diagnosis will rest mostly in the uh, morphologic findings. But in rhabdomyosarcoma, you also will find uh, de certain degrees of myogenin or desmin or myoD positivity in tumor cells. Sometimes you will diagnose a rhabdomyosarcoma in a metastatic site. In these cases, when it has elapsed, sometimes from the original diagnosis, and there was no rhabdomyosarcoma in the initial tumor, you can diagnose it as being a secondary malignancy from the germ cell tumor by doing the fish for the chromosome 12P. In this image, you see a metastasis of a rhabdomyosarcoma in the lung. You can also appreciate here in the insect that some of the cells still have some immature morphology here towards the bottom right of the screen. But the great majority of them 
now have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. And this is likely as a result of the chemotherapy. Now, you have to be worried about this other entity, which is rhabdomyomatous tumor after chemotherapy. So some patients with hysteriogenital tumor who underwent chemotherapy and have persistent retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, they will have rhabdomyomatous tumors in their retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. So what do you have to have to, in order to call it rhabdomyomatous tumor and not rhabdomyosarcoma? So these tumors are, they show fetal type rhabdomyocyte with central to peripheral nuclei and abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm with occasional of cross striation. So it looks like rhabdomyoblast. There is nuclear enlargement, there is nuclear atypia, there are nucleoli. But you, what you don't have is you don't have mitosis, you don't have necrosis, and there is no primitive cellular component. Remember that metastasis that I showed in the lung, they had a primitive cellular component. These do not have that. They're completely differentiated or in a more advanced differentiation stage without the primitive cell component. Other teratomatous components are also usually present. So here you have a monotonous population of, of rhabdomyoblasts, where you see centrally located nuclei with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, but there is no mitosis, and no necrosis, and no primitive component. There is not a small round cell population. This image in the right shows myotubules with multiple nuclei uh, per sarcoplasm. Sarco so you see a different degree, maybe more advanced degree, into a rhabdomyomatous differentiation. Again, this is different than rhabdomyosarcoma because there is no mitosis, no uh, necrosis, and no primitive component. Another example, you see the rhabdomyoblast, with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, some multinucleated giant cells, but you do not have any necrosis, any mitosis, or primitive component. Now we go to primitive neuroectodermal tumor. This is the second most common somatic malignancy arising in teratoma. There are two types of peanuts, central and peripheral. Peripheral peanuts is a spectrum of tumors known as the Ewing sarcoma family of tumors. And almost all of them have reciprocal translocation in EWSR1 a gene in chromosome 22. Central peanuts are primitive embryonic type of tumors occurring in the central nervous system that most frequently pre present in children, and they do not harbor EWSR1 translocation. Peanuts arising in teratomas, almost exclusively of them, are of central type, and therefore, they do not carry EWSR1 translocation seen in peripheral U with sarcoma or peanuts. Now, central peanuts have a morphologic classification. They can be classified as medulloblastoma, medulloepithelioma, embryonal tumor with multilayer rosettes, and others. One study in 1997 that looked at this morphologic classification and had follow up found no association between the type of peanut and the clinical outcome. Furthermore, there is no uh, association between the type of peanut that you have in the primary tumor and the one that you will find in the metastasis. And therefore, in, in current clinical practice, we do not subtype the, morph the, the peanuts arising in germ cell tumors. Testicular germ cell tumors. So the peanuts are almost invariably associated with germ cell malignancy in the primary tumor. Uh, the most common by far is teratoma. They can be mature or immature, but they can also be found in association with yolk sac tumor, embryonal carcinoma. Um, there are no uh, uh, reports of association with chorio carcinoma, but this is, uh, we know that chorio carcinoma is the rarest of all the germ cell tumors. And some of the cases, as I showed that one arising in the intertubular space, will originate only in association with germ cell neoplasia in situ, but this is very rare. In the metastatic side, they are most frequently by themselves. So in the primary cell, they're almost always associated with 
another component of Gerson malignancy, but when they present in the metastasis, they might be by, by themselves. This is an, an image of a, a, a peanut arising in terms of tumor, where you see a, two populations of cells. Some of them are larger with more open chromatin and more elongated nuclei. And then there are, there are smaller cells in between that have more pignotic nuclei undergoing apoptosis. You can also identify some areas with pseudo rosettes. This is another example of a peanut. You can see in between the tubules and monotonous population of a small round blue cells expanding beyond a forex field and with an infiltrative growth pattern. <clears throat> in this case, we can see that the epithelial component is more prominent. But again, the cells have a primitive appearance with a scanned cytoplasm. Some of them have clearing of the cytoplasm. And there is some, some a tubule formation in this particular case. This is a very epithelial type of peanut. You have to suspect it when this is expanding beyond a forex field. And even though it's making tubules, in this particular case, the main differential diagnosis would be a, a glandular yolk sac due to the clearing around of this around the nuclear type, the nucleus. This is a closer look to an, a peanut that has more of a spindle cell morphology. The still is composed of a small blue cells with more open chromatin and clearing around the nuclei. Here is not so evident the two cell populations, but you can identify some of them as being smaller and more hyperchromatic, possibly undergoing apoptosis. This nesting appearance at low power is characteristic of the medulloblastoma type of peanut. But again, we do not do make any morphologic classification of peanuts, as you can see here. This is a closer look. And what you have to see is the, the fibrillary type of interstitial in this tumor is characteristic. It's not unfrequent that somatic malignancy arising in our tumors are composed by two different somatic malignancies. Here we see a peanut and a chondrosarcoma side by side. So the immunophenotype of uh, peanuts, they are uh, focally or diffusely positive for CD9, CD99, that's variable. They can be positive for some uh, cytokeratins A13 and CAM5.2 in up to 60% of the cases. S100 is positive focally, at least in 80% of the cases. Synaptophysin can be positive, but chromogranin is usually negative. GFAP and is, can be positive focally in 70% of the cases. Neurofibrillary protein is usually negative. NKX 2.1, which is a marker of peripheral Ewing sarcoma, we have found it positive in, in some cases, but there is no experience in the literature of, of the significance of NKX 2.1. Desmin and other muscle markers are mostly negative, and this is a, a very important for the differential diagnosis with the other common sarcoma arising in terms of tumor, which is rhabdoma and sarcoma. In connection with PNET, we're going to go now to neuroglial differentiation in terms of tumors. These are uh, more frequently seen, just like the others, in retroperitoneum uh, metastasis after chemotherapy. They can also be diagnosed in primary tumors. They, we have proposed that these will follow the same classifications as the CNS astrocytic neoplasm. So far, there has been uh, there has not been any case in visceral metastasis, except for one that had sarcomatory, undifferentiated sarcoma transformation. But the neuroglial component has not metastasized into any visceral organ, so uh, we don't know if they have that potential. We know, for example, that glioblastomas in the CNS occasionally can metastasize outside the CNS, but we haven't had a glioblastoma arising in a germ cell tumor that gave a visceral metastasis yet. We have seen one case that involved the pelvic bone, and that had been treated by radiotherapy and did not resolve with radiotherapy six months after treatment. The spectrum of <clears throat> neuroglial differentiation starts from the lowest end. So it's well known that teratomas can have 
areas that look like brain. <laughs> These we have uh, termed developing CNS or central nervous system. And they are populations of neuroglial cells and ganglion cells, but they are not expansive. It, they don't grow beyond a one low power field. In the same spectrum of morphology, you can have areas with ependymal differentiation, as you see here. But sometimes it becomes more cellular, the cells become more atypical with irregular nuclei, hyperchromation, and cyst formation. These cells also have elongated cytoplasmic processes that are eosinophilic. So this would be best classified as a low-grade astrocytoma with microcyst formation and pilocytic features. Some cases with neuroglial differentiation will mimic more a gemistocytic astrocytoma. As you see here, the cells have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and eccentric nuclei, similar to the gemistocytic astrocytomas in the CNS. This is another example of a astrocytoma with some cells showing gemistocytic differentiation. Another example with, with atypical cells some of them with the um, eosinophilic processes, and some of them with gemistocytic morphology. But now the astrocytoma, when there is a diffuse population of cells with a featurely growth pattern, but there is no mitosis or necrosis, then we call that diffuse astrocytoma. And a plastic astrocytoma would be a stage, a, a, a grade higher, where there is more pronounced nucleotypia and there are mitosis that can be appreciated, and then it will correspond to an anaplastic astrocytoma. We saw a couple of examples of anaplastic astrocytoma with giant cell features, as you can see here. In a, this is the case in a metastatic lymph node, retrograde lymph node. You can see that here. They're giant cells with marked anaplasia. Another example. Tumors can also make gangliogliomas, where some of the cells will have gangliocytic differentiation, as you see here, tumor cells, and some of them with more ganglion-like differentiation. You can appreciate that here better, in this lower grade tumor. These are gangliogliomas arising in germ cell tumors. And then sometimes you will identify a small fossa of necrosis with nuclear pseudopalisading around that fossa of necrosis and some vasculature formation, a characteristic of glioblastoma. And this is an example where you have a, a, a glial neoplasm that is transforming into an undifferentiated sarcoma with some bone formation in this area. And this is a gliosarcoma. Now, how do we diagnose these cases where you have a teratoma and then you have areas where the, the, uh, the tumor has this fibrillary interstitium and composed of cells with varying degree of atypia, some of them elongated. As you can see here, this is an area of neuroglial differentiation, another one, another one, another one. This is the case with the ependymal CNS differentiation. And you can see that they are all GFAP positive. We investigated the molecular mechanisms associated with these and they all had ATRX retained. There was no IDH overexpression. So it, meaning that they had a different pathway of carcinogenesis as compared to the ones in the CNF. Some of the one, astrocytomas with giant cells did have P53 mutation, or one of them had P53 mutation and uh, was overexpressed by immunohistochemistry. BRAF overexpression was in only one case. So all these patients had history of chemotherapy, um, or four did have confirmation of chemotherapy. Some, uh, a few presented as primary tumors. One had a local recurrence, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the case with gliosarcoma developed lung metastasis of a poorly differentiated sarcoma that was morphologically similar to that sarcomatic component in the retrobritinia. This is an image that shows a needle biopsy of that bone recurrence in a patient that had a, a um, neuroglial differentiation in the germ cell neoplasia. So you can see here 
this is quite fibrotic, fibrotic background, but when you do GFAP, you can identify that uh, all these cells express GFAP. And this after treatment with chemotherapy and radiotherapy is not very hypercellular. It had low KI67 as well. You can see the fibrillary uh, interstitium and the angulated uh, tumor cells. But they still persist and they're visible in the, in the, uh, uh, in the CAT scan or MRI. So other sarcomas can also uh, present as somatic malignancies arising into a tumor. And um, we can, sometimes we cannot subclassify them, so we would call that malignant proliferation of spindle cells that would be a sarcoma NOS. You can also, as I show you a case, you can have chondrosarcoma or angiosarcoma or different degrees of differentiation. Malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor has also been reported. And the recommendation is that these sarcomas be graded following the French Federation Cancer Center Sarcoma Group or the FNCLCC state, uh, grading system. Here is an example of a sarcoma NOS or no, not otherwise classified. You have the ter teratoma component here on top, and then a diffuse monotonous population of spindle cells that don't show any specific differentiation. We do immunohistochemistry, and this doesn't stain with any particular uh, differentiation pattern, then it can be classified as sarcoma NOS. You can see the intersecting fascicles, but the immunohistochemistry just didn't confirm the nature of these cells. This is an example of an angiosarcoma arising in a teratoma. So you can you see the vascular proliferation in between a tumor nest here. The some residual teratoma and this vascular proliferation infiltrating in between the teratoma uh, cells. You see here more vascular spaces and some residual teratoma glands in an angiosarcoma arising in a teratoma. This is an area of pure angiosarcoma arising in a teratoma. So the FNCLCC um, grading system considers the differentiation and the mitotic count and the tumor necrosis in, in points from one, two, three for the first two and then zero, one, and two for tumor necrosis. So basically, depending on how closely the tumor differentiation depends on how closely the tumor resembles normal uh, adult mesenchymal tissue that would be well differentiated, uh, uh, liposarcoma, for example. Uh, sarcoma with, uh, score two would be those who have uh, uh, some resemblance, but we cannot completely um, uh, diagnose it without the help of ancillary tests. And then uh, grade three are embryonos uh, and un undifferentiated sarcomas. For example, peanuts would in and rhabdomyosarcomas sarcomas would fall into score uh, three for the tumor differentiation. And then the mitotic count would give you one, two, three, and then you would have a final score of grade one, two, or three uh, for the histologic grade. These are important not so much in rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and, and peanuts that are the most common and they're always uh, high grade. But if you have an angiosarcoma, that, uh, the, the French system will help guide the management or a chondro sarcoma, for example. Now, every time you have a sarcoma arising in germ cell tumor, you have to make sure you're not overlooking a sarcomatoid yolk sac tumor. Uh, this, almost all of them occur after chemotherapy, but so is the case of the other sarcomas. They're composed of a spindle and epithelial cells, and the background yeah, varies from myxoid to fibrous trauma. The majority of them are high grade with significant nuclear atypia. And one, one series of 14 cases, eight patients died of disease at the mean follow-up of 58 months. Here we see an, an example of a sarcomatoid yolk sac tumor in a metastasis many years after the initial um, germ cell malignancy. You can see that it's composed of a mixed population, some of them more spindle, some of them more epithelial. They're highly atypical. And you diagnose it based on the immunophenotype. You have to think about it and then uh, do the appropriate immunohistochemistry. These are typically focally positive for cytokeratin, diffuse positive for glipican 3, 
and they can show other markers of EOXAC, including CDX2 or alpha fetoprotein. They can also be positive in the majority of cases for SOL4. These are other examples of sarcomatoid EOXAC from this publication in 2015 from Howitt et al. You can see that the uh, mixoid tumor the mixoid uh, tumor background that makes these mixoid tumor ringlets is characteristic of sarcomatoid yoxa. And some of them will have more abundant collagen deposition in between the tumor cells, and this has been termed parietal differentiation. This is an example in the primary tumor where you have solid yoxide with areas of microcyst formation and then a monotonous population of small spindle and epithelial cells next to it. They're both positive for cytokeratin, and they're both positive for glypican 3. None of the other sarcomatoid markers were positive, therefore this was best classified as sarcomatoid yoxac tumor. Now carcinomas can also be a component of a somatic malignancy arising in germ cell malignancies. And these have the different morphologies that you can see in carcinomas somewhere else. They can have mucinous phenotype. They can look enteric type with the dirty central necrosis. Or they can have endometrioid-like morphology with some areas of squamous differentiation. Or they can have acinar-like differentiation. Now, similar to sarcomas, they, they have to be differentiated from sarcoma to yolk sac. Carcinomas arising in a, in a teratoma and a germ cell malignancy has to be differentiated from other carcinoma uh, or glandular yolk sac tumor. In the glandular yolk sac tumor, we have characteristically supra and if, uh, subnuclear vacuums. This is an example of glandular yolk sac, and this particular case is the uh, primary tumor of that metastatic. So, um, spindle cell or sarcoma to yolk sac tumor that later presented and I showed you the case. You can see the subnuclear and supranuclear vacuoles. So this instead of just calling it carcinoma arising in terms of tumor, you had to first investigate whether this would fit the immunophenotype of a glandular yolk sac. And you do the immunohistochemistry panel that I mentioned. Very rarely, you will have a nephroblastoma arising in a germ cell uh, malignancy. And how do you identify nephroblastoma or Wilms tumors? It's by following the same diagnostic criteria in the kidney. You have the three components, the epithelial, the blastema components, and the stroma components. So you have the three types of differentiation here. You can see another area here with tubular formation epithelial primitive looking cells, but they are more columnar, the hyperperforation rate, and then you have a stroma component here and a blastema component down here. Some of them will try to make little uh, rudimentary glomeruli, as you see here. The same morphologic approach as you see in Wolf's tumor. Same, another area here. There is one case report uh, that showed that and this nephroblastoma had loss of heterozygosity in 11p13, which is the locus of inactivation of WT1 in patients genetically predisposed to nephroblastomas. So uh, this particular case, because of the loss of WT1, was negative for WT1 by immunohistochemistry in this publication. So now we're going to talk a little bit about prognosis of secondary somatic malignancy in germ cell tumors. Uh, they usually do not respond to the usual germ cell tumor chemotherapy. If they are isolated to the testes, they have limited significance. They're usually cured with surgery. If seen in the retroperitoneum, they have good prognosis if they can be resected. They, if they are not resectable, then they have a poor outcome. In the mediastinum, they're almost always lethal because they cannot be resected completely. The prognosis varies based on grade, time of diagnosis, and resectability. Here in this graph, in this publication, you can see 
that the prognosis of somatic malignancy arising in germ cell tumor when they are diagnosed at the same time as the germ cell tumor, meaning in the primary tumor or in the retroperitoneum, but at the same time, the prognosis is much better than when they are diagnosed uh, later on. In this graph, it shows the survival curve of the different types of somatic malignancy. And you see that there is a very significant overlap between adenocarcinoma and uh, other sarcomas or PNET. They all fall very much the same survival curve. Rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma seems to have a slightly better prognosis. It's also important whether the patient had received chemotherapy. So in patients with no prior chemotherapy in which somatic malignancy is diagnosed, they have much better prognosis than those in which somatic malignancy, in whom the somatic malignancy presents after uh, chemotherapy. And it also it is worse if they have one or two different regimens of chemotherapy. So the, here you have one chemotherapy regimen and then two different uh, chemotherapies and then these patients do worse. What is worse to have sarcoma or carcinoma or sarcoma to yolk sac, they all fall very much close to each other. They have the similar prognosis. And again, here we have initial RPLND or retroperitoneal lymph node dissection versus uh, those patients who have a recurrence and they require a, a second RPLND. The ones that recur have the worst prognosis. And then the time to the relapse is also important. If there is a late relapse, meaning that it's after 24 months or two years after the first complete remission, those patients do much worse than the patients who relapse early. Grading is important, as I mentioned. So if you have a sarcoma or a carcinoma, you have to provide a grade, and you can see how the prognosis is different in between low grade, high grade, low grade sarcoma, high grade sarcoma, low grade sarcoma to yoxide versus high grade sarcoma to yoxide, low grade carcinoma versus high grade carcinoma. Where is the therapy? The therapy is the same as germ cell tumors, but may vary a little bit depending on the center. If the center is a, it's a center of excellence for RPLND, for retroperitoneal and lymph node dissections, those centers will offer retroperitoneal lymph node dissection if the somatic malignancy has been diagnosed in the primary tumor. The reason is that the likelihood of these tumors to respond to chemotherapy is less, so they would do the RPLND even in stage one to remove any potential site of disease. Surgical excision is the best therapy, so that's when they recur later on isochrome 12P, isochromosome 12P, uh, fish is helpful to determine whether that is a second new primary or is a relapse from the germ cell neoplasia to decide whether they're going to go directly to surgical excision attempt or they would do chemotherapy. The chemotherapy regimens targeting the histologic septime malignancy is sometimes used, but there is no good follow-up data to see whether that's really effective. The most common change to the chemotherapy regimen is when you have PNET in which they will add a topocide or, uh, or a PNET specific chemotherapy. But again, there is not no significant uh, follow-up with those uh, patients. So in conclusion, and some take-home messages, the somatic malignancies are rare in testicular germ cell tumors and are most commonly associated with teratomas. They can be seen both in primary and metastatic sites. They exhibit a full range of differentiation, including sarcomas, carcinomas, and glial neoplasms. The grade, the time of presentation, resectability are the main prognostic factors. And patients do usually do not respond to chemotherapy, uh, but transformation-specific drugs are used, so therefore we try to uh, give the appropriate name to that somatic malignancy. That's all I have. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Matoso, for your excellent discussion on the somatic malignancy in germ cell tumors. I have got a few questions. So the first question is from Chenagiri. The question is,
can the tumor be entirely composed of peanut like areas yes that's most common in metastatic site in the primary tumor you will almost invariably see it in association with teratoma or other germ cell component in metastasis is more commonly seen in a pure form and not associated with another component uh, there's another question online uh, let me read that for you uh, this is from Emmanuel. The question is, is there any use for assessing retention of isochromosome 12P in malignancy in germ cell tumors? The use is when the differential diagnosis. So the only use is in the metastatic site and in the relapse form when there is a question whether this represents a new somatic malignancy or a relapse from the germ cell malignancy. And the utility in that setting is to decide whether they would do surgery upfront without trying chemotherapy, which would be the management of a somatic malignancy arising in a germ cell tumor, or they would do chemotherapy uh, as a neoadjuvant, assuming that it's a new primary, and then attempt a surgical resection. Also, for example, when you get an adenocarcinoma um, in, for example, metastatic in the liver and it has intestinal differentiation, it's helpful in that setting to see whether the clinicians need to search for a occult primary in the GI tract or will this be diagnosed upfront as a uh, recurrence with a somatic malignancy. Thank you. The next question is from Ambarish Paris. So the question is, are the somatic malignancy in germ cell tumors, do they behave differently? And is there any different therapeutic response from pure germ cell tumors? Right. So I mentioned that towards the end um, of the presentation, in some places they will adjust the chemotherapy, specifically for PNET. Uh, they would do a toposide uh, or a peanut specific chemotherapy. But the data is not so abundant in terms of the efficacy of that uh, treatment. But it is important to, to provide the name of the, the type of uh, somatic malignancy so that they can adjust chemotherapy if the oncologist see that appropriate. Uh, the next question is from Ahsan, uh, who wants to know, uh, is there, uh, can we still use the term immature teratogenic tumor in the testis? Well, that, that's a term that is in disuse right now. So teratomas in the testis are classified as prepubertal teratomas, which are benign, they occur in children. They are not associated with germ cell nucleus in situ. And postpubertal teratomas that they occur in adults and they are associated with germ cell neoplasia in situ. Occasionally, you will have a well differentiated teratoma in an adult that is of the prepubertal type. And for those, you need to exclude germ cell neoplasia in situ. You also need to make sure that, um, that this is mature and doesn't have significant atypia that there is no areas of a scar in the testis that could have been a regressed germ cell tumor, that there are no uh, calcifications that uh, could suggest that there was germ cell neoplasia in situ, and is negative for isochrome 12 b In that setting only, then you can suggest that this well-differentiated teratoma in an adult would be a benign teratoma. But I will not recommend the use of that terminology. Right. Uh, the next question is from Minesh. So he wants to know two questions actually. Uh, what is the real incidence of true sarcoma NOS? And the second question is related to it uh, is that should all somatic sarcoma NOS be immunostained or typed to rule out sarcomatoid yoxic tumor? 
the the sarcomato NOS incidence, the first part of the question, is um, is lower than three percent. So you can expect three to six percent of somatic malignancies. Most cases, you will diagnose a rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and a peanut, and then some small proportion of the somatic malignancies would be sarcoma NOS. And it's correct. I would recommend doing uh, the appropriate immunostaining to rule out sarcoma to yolk sac when you have a sarcoma NOS. Uh, the next question is uh, from Anand, so, who wants to know, do we get to see 12P in somatic malignancy? Yes, and we use it. Uh, to to diagnose somatic malignancy arising in terms of tumor. Now it's not a hundred percent sensitive, so a negative result that is not excluded entirely, but it's helpful. It's over eighty percent positive. Uh, there is another question from Chenagiri. Uh, the question is that they have seen a case of ependymoma in the ovary, and do you have any experience of seeing it in testes? I I have not seen an ependymoma uh, in the testes now. The over the ovarian spectrum of morphology is more broad, and the classification of the central uh, of the CNS is applicable. Uh, the different type of morphology in the ovarian setting, and uh, we have not seen the same in the testes. I mean, we right, classify uh, the astroglial tumors as in the CNS, just to give an idea of grade, the same as uh, as with sarcomas. So the next one is from Jeanette. So the question is, what's the five-year survival of sarcomatous tumor in germ cell tumors, whether surgically treated, is chemo effective? I think, yeah, that's the question. The survival is great if it's resectable. If the tumor is not resectable, that's when you see uh, these type of survivals, uh, where you have about 50% uh, survival in, in eight to 10 years. Uh, there's it's another like, question. Like multiple metastases and they just became unresectable. Uh, the next question is from Emmanuel, uh, who wants to know, are there any predilections for metastasis other than retroperitoneal lymph node? Long, I would say. We've seen it in long. So what you have to, um, uh, what has happened sometimes is you see a sarcoma in the lung in a patient with history of germ cell neoplasia. And then you go back and pull out the retroperitoneal lymph node dissection or request that, um, that material. And then you will see an area of sarcomatoid transformation there. And that's helpful to arrive at the diagnosis of a, of a metastasis from the germ cell tumor as opposed to a new sarcoma. Right. Uh, there is another question. Uh, have you seen squamous cell carcinoma from teratoma? Is it rare? It's very rare. I have seen it, but it's, it's very rare. You can also have carcinoid tumors or, or yes, squamous cell carcinoma, but it's, it's rare. You can have any carcinoma. Uh, the next question is from Emmanuel again. So is there a difference between carcinoma and sarcoma arising from germ cell tumor regarding a root of metastasis? I don't know that for sure. The root of metastasis is usually retroperitoneal lymph nodes first, but I don't have uh, uh, the data to see uh, for sure whether they, they follow. One is more likely than the other to have uh, hematogenous metastasis, I don't know. Uh, there's another question from Jalila. So do you diagnose prepubertal type of teratoma in adults without P12 fish? Uh, no. You have to meet all those five criteria. Uh, no significant atypia, no mitosis, no areas of scarring, suggesting so regress terms of tumor, no classifications, and no tumor terms of neoplasia in situ, and no cause isochromatopathy. I would not recommend everything. I want to have that negative isochromatopathy. Right. Uh, so here's another question. Uh, how do you differentiate cystic trophoblastic tumor from squamous cell carcinoma in a true cut biopsy? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, the trophoblastic tumors are usually strong positive for GATA3, while, uh, while uh, squamous carcinomas, the GATA3 is weaker. Um, but uh, there are other markers, are Malcolm A, that can be positive trophoblastic tumors. Uh, but this is a very rare uh, scenario, and I'm not sure that in a needle biopsy I would be 100% definitive. Right. Uh, someone has this comment rather than a question that uh, they have seen squamous cell carcinoma from teratoma rather than PNET from teratoma. Yes, it can happen both. I think uh, these are the questions that you have. Uh, there's one more, I think, Devon. So the question is, is there any difference of incidence in normal testis versus undescended testis? I don't think there is any study looking particularly at undescended testis versus um, those who don't have a history of cryptorchidism. Uh, but na naturally, cryptorchid testis have higher incidence of germ cell neoplasia in general. Uh, but I do not know of any study that had prepared that. So one last question, I guess, from Suma that uh, who wants to know if there is any difference in occurrence of somatic malignancy between ovary and testis, do you have any idea? Well, I don't have the experience in ovary, so I, I won't be able to comment. I think that's all the, the questions that we have. And if you have more questions, uh, you can please reach out to either us or you can reach out to Dr. Matosa on his Twitter handle or you can email him. He would be more than happy to answer your questions. Sure. Thank you. And, uh, thank you again, Dr. Matosa, for this excellent Bye. discussion. Thank and you. you would be very happy to hear that you had uh, several hundred viewers who defied different time zones and listened to you. And I could keep track of uh, viewers from at least 35 different countries including viewers from Argentina, Bolivia, Kuwait, Bosnia, Uruguay, Vietnam, and of course we had viewers from US and also uh, from India. So thank you again, all of our viewers for your support. And uh, if you like our lectures, please uh, follow and like our Facebook page and also subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel so that you can stay updated. And also subscribe to our podcast newsletter that will also keep you updated about uh, the next uh, lectures and all the upcoming lectures. And, and in fact, we have our next podcast coming up on Friday. So that would be at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we will have speaker, Dr. Fernando Smith, who is from University of Portugal. And the talk is on breast core needle biopsy, the potentials and limitations. So hope to see you all at that time. And thank you again, Dr. Matoso. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.